Good morning. Good morning, church. Hi, it's nice to see you all, those here and those online. Welcome to Wilsborough Baptist Church. Woo! <laughs> my name's Hannah, and my wonderful assistant today is Terry. Oh, easy, easy. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lovely morning, the sun is shining, and we have a special dedication today, Baby Woo! Rafa. Yay! And all the family, Kelly and Andrew and all your family and friends, welcome to Wilsborough Baptist Church. I hope you have an amazing day, and it's great to celebrate the birth of a baby. Hallelujah. Mr. Terry. Thank you very much. Um, just a few practicalities and notices before we... Come to worship our Lord. Um, communion will be taken during the service and the practicalities of it, uh, Mark will explain to church as we do it. For folks at home, if you'd like to take this opportunity to, to get, your, uh, get your bread, bread and wine and, and then join with us at the appropriate moment. Thank you. Now, also following the service this morning, there will be a short church meeting. Now, I put the word short in, in an eager anticipation of it being so. Um, nonetheless, uh, towards the end of the service, we'll have a break, we'll grab a coffee. We're all welcome to stay. It isn't just for church members, so it is for everyone, um, because we are all part of God's family. Uh, and so please stay on for that meeting. Now, next Saturday, there will be a quiz here in the evening. And I, at my last hearing of how many tables we've got booked, it's rather low. So I'd like to encourage you to come along and book a table. It's three pound per person, tables of six. All money's raised is going to go to the Ukraine Relief Fund. So please come along uh, and take part. And just as a taster, if I can remember them, I've got a couple of questions. So the first one is a mathematical question, and what is the square, <laughs> the square root of four? And I wouldn't know, because I'm not a mathematician. I don't even know if there is one. I think, Katie, there, there we go. There we are, thank you. <laughs> now, the other one is a memory test, and this is aimed at some young people over here, because I'm going to speak to you in a foreign language, and I want some of you, one of you to stand up and say what it is. And it's quite simple. It's Baruch Adar Adonai Elohim Melech HaOlem. Who can remember? Memory test, young people. Baruch, Ad, Ad, sorry? Hebrew. Yeah, it's Hebrew. Right, now what was it? What was it? Come on. No, doesn't. <laughs> They're conversing. <laughs> they don't work it out. Something together. that we used to put up on the, on the, the wall in the youth room. Um, it's Hebrew and it is, blessed art thou, Lord our God, creator of heaven and earth. And we're here today to honour and worship our God in heaven. And then the final notice I've got, for the moment at least, is a plug for the well. Um, to, <laughs> thank you. Tuesday, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturday mornings. Um, please come along, bring your friends along. Uh, and for those of you at home that perhaps are missing out a little bit on church and being together with church, this is an excellent opportunity for you to come and join us. And, and so please do come along and join in at the well, and we're not going to sing your song. Um, so, Hannah, over Thank to you. you. Before we go into worship, I want to read a scripture, um, just to get us in the right frame of mind. So, Psalms 46, it says, God is our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though it waters roar and form, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will keep her and at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord God Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And I just wanted to kind of encapsulate something that this week, um, it was International Happiness Day. I think it was a Friday, Saturday. And 
it just brought in, you know, in terms of like everything that's going on in the world and around us. There's so many injustices. There's so, and, you know, every day we hear about things that are happening. But our hope and our trust is in God. Yeah, and we have to be intentional about being happy, even in the midst of horrible, you know, um, chaotic things that are happening around us. Now, if we believe that God is our refuge and our strength, then that's what we do. We take courage and we are happy intentionally, regardless of how our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions are. So let's, um, yeah, let's just bring this together and let's pray. Father God, I thank you that in the midst of trouble, as your word says, you are our fortress, you are our strength, you are our deliverer. And Lord, when we fail, Lord, to, um, to take uh, our eyes, when we fail and we take our eyes off of you, Lord God, I pray that you will bring this prayer into rem- remembrance. Lord, that we remember that regardless of what's around us, Father, I pray that we will dwell in the place of the Most High, that we will seek our, f- our refuge in you, Lord God. And when times are rough and when we are feeling despondent, I pray, Lord God, that you will capsulate us in your arms, that you will hug us, Father God, and that life will, you know, will just come back in terms of remembering just how good and how wonderful you are. So, Father God, we lift our prayers before you, Lord God. As we come together now, we want to take off all those worries and those cares, Lord, and throw them out, and we want to come into a place of seeking you, of praising you, giving you the adoration that you so deserve. So, Father, we thank you that you love us, Lord, regardless of how we feel about ourselves. So, Father, come and habitat with us today, Lord God. Let us feast of your wonderful table as we give you the honour, the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Over to you. Let's stand together, shall we, as we worship God.
sun for bed to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be We live like your grace is stronger than all our faults and failures. Could we live like your love is deeper than our hearts could fathom? Could we live like this? Could we live like your
when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. darkness my god that is who you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are hello yeah, we thank you that you you make a way, Lord God. You, you make a way where there seems to be no way. And, um, and Lord, we, we stand here and we thank you that you are with us. And Lord, even when we don't feel it, even when we can't see it, Lord, you're with us, you're working, you're moving. And, um, and Lord, you work for, good, for the good of those who love you. And uh, yeah, I just feel these words today um, from Isaiah 43, just as we were singing that song, well-known verses. Um, but maybe for, for some people here today, it says, This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses and army and reinforcements together, and there they lay, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And our God is mighty to make a way, even when it seems like the opposition is uh, you just, yeah, not, not overcomable. And our God is, our God is able to, um, to make a way through. And, um, and he wants us to look to the things that he's going to do in the months and, and years to come in our lives. So, um, yeah, just invite you to take your seats just for a moment. We're going to, we, we've got the joy now of a dedication. So I want to invite up Andy and, and Kelly and Rafa and I don't know, do Reeve and, and EG and Thads, I don't know if you want to come up as well, you're welcome to. I'll leave that to your parents as to whether you all come up or, you know, you are. You're all very welcome to come up. Ah, come Stads, great, good stuff. So, um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with what we're doing this morning, what is a dedication, what does that mean? Well, um, our, our way of welcoming um, young people, children into the family of God in this church is to, is to give thanks, actually. So dedication, first, we want to give thanks to God for the gift of Rafa, um, for blessing not only Andy and Kelly and the family with Rafa, but actually the whole church family. And so we, we want to welcome Rafa into the church family in the name of Jesus. Um, cool. <laughs> we... 
We also want to bless Rafa and bless the family. And so actually, just as part of this, this is a new thing um, that we're going to give a go this morning. So you've probably, I don't have one up here to wave as an example, but some of you will have a little piece of paper and it'll say Rafa Boaz Boylan on it. So, so people are waving them around here. There's lots of these scattered around. If you don't have one and you want one, um, then just try and nick a spare one or ask us. But we want you to write a, like a little prayer or a, um, or, or a blessing or maybe a scripture verse or even a, a prophetic word, perhaps something you feel God is saying for Rafa today on, that, on those pieces of paper. And we'll collect those up. You can put them in the offering baskets actually on the way out. We'll collect those. We'll give them to Annie and Kelly. And who knows, maybe, maybe Rafa can read them in the years to come. Uh, so that'd be great. And then also there's this dedication part. And actually, really, um, it's, it's Andy and Kelly who are making that dedication, that commitment to say, we want to bring Rafa up, um, you know, within Christian community. We want to bring him up and, and teach him about Jesus. So he has that opportunity in due course uh, to make a decision as to whether he wants to follow Jesus himself. And, and of course, in our church at that time, that's when we do baptisms upon a, a kind of like somebody saying, yes. I'm in, I want to follow Jesus. And so there's that dedication, but also there's a bigger dedication, which is as a whole church, we will be saying, and we are totally committed 100% to being with the whole family on this journey to support him. We recognize that it's the job of the whole church to raise up children and young people. It's the whole community. And, and if you like, as we do that and as we commit and we say, yeah, we will pray, we will support, we will love and encourage. Um, we're also recommitting to do that for all the children and young people in our congregation who are here this morning. So... That is a little snapshot of what a dedication is. And um, I just want to read this scripture as we start, and then there'll be some promises. As I say, there'll be a promise for the congregation, and I think also um, uh, Kelly's discipleship group are going to come up and pray. So I'll give you a prompt when that's coming. But um, just reading this scripture from Psalm 145. It says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I'll praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. One generation commends your works to another. We want to commend the works of God to Rapha as he gets older. So, uh, Annie and Kelly, it's your, your promises here. I'm going to get you a microphone, actually. Okay, hopefully this works. So, um, so Annie and Kelly, do you uh, thank God for the gift of your child and do you accept the joys and duties of parenthood? We do. Do you promise to bring Rafa up within the Christian community and by God's grace so to live that he will be nurtured by Christian love and surrounded by the life of Jesus? As disciples of Jesus, we, we do. do. Wonderful. What names have you given to your son? Rafa Boaz Boylan. Cool. You don't need to read that bit off there, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and can you tell us, tell us just, um, is this, I don't know if this is on, oh, it's on. Can you tell us, like, tell us a bit about the names? I'd love to know sure. a bit about the names. <clears throat> so the name Rapha we chose because in the Old Testament, the Israelites used to call on God and call him Yahweh Rapha or Jehovah Rapha, which means God heals and God um, redeems. And we also named him Boaz. If you read in the book of Ruth, um, Boaz married Ruth and he showed such love and grace and kindness to her. Um, and yeah, we just thought it was just a beautiful name. And it was also suggested by friends of mine in my discipleship group. So uh, that's one of the reasons why they're coming up to pray for him too. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, it's a strong, it's a strong name, isn't it? Rafa Boaz Boylan. So, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this is this is the bit that every single minister kind of dreads um, when they take they take Rafa. But it's okay. I've I've held Rafa before, and I think he, I think he kind of likes me, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Rafa Boaz Boylan, we greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus and welcome you into the community of God's people. And, um, and this is a promise for you guys. So do you want to stand? Stand, uh, everyone, everyone who's here who wants to join in this promise, stand. The answer to this is we will. Okay, so, uh, so gathered here 
as members of this congregation and as representatives of the wider church of God, do you promise to offer Rafa and his family your love and support and being faithful in prayer, will you share your faith with him by word and example? We will. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to invite up the discipleship group now to pray. And um, it's a big promise that, to remember to pray and commit to prayer. So I just want to encourage you to, to remember that. You can, you can, all, you can all sit um, and gather around. I'm going to give, um, I'm going to give Rafa, to, Rafa to Andy. There you go, mate. <laughs> Do you guys want to go in the middle and then we'll kind of surround you? Okay, okay, what an amazing privilege to pray for you guys, and particularly Rafa. Um, every time I look at him, he always smiles, even when he's feeling grumpy, so, and when he's feeling ill. So I just want to thank God for Rafa, and I just thank you that you are the giver of life, God, mm. and you've given uh, Kelly and Andrew this amazing, beautiful little boy, Lord. And I just pray a real blessing on him now, today. I thank you that you have plans for him, Lord, that you had plans before he was even born, Lord. And I just place him into your hands now. Amen. 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 Rafa, you can be strong and courageous. You will have strength when you need it most. You need never be afraid. You are his and you are free. You have been made righteous through Christ. You have the Lord on your side. Do not fear. And Rafa, you are a child of God. Mm. Father God, I lift up Rafa to you this morning um, and also his siblings, e.g. Reeve and Thaddeus. Lord, they are now a unit of four. May they grow in strength as siblings um, and may they grow in strength with you, Father God. Um, and we lift up Team Boylan to you now. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen. God, I want to thank you for the gift of baby Rafa. He is such a blessing on all of us. I pray that he is filled with love and joy every single day and that his beautiful big smile lights up everybody's lives, just like it does all of ours. I pray that you protect and guide him through all of his life. Lord, I just want to lift Rafa and his lovely family up to you and I pray that you will fill him with the Holy Spirit so, so much that it overflows and fills this room. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, I had... Mark stole my psalm. Did I? <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've just found another one. <laughs> no. Um, so in Psalm 95, it says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. And I just, I just feel like Raph is such a joy bringer. Mm. He's such a joy bringer. Rachel's so right. When he, <laughs> even when he had two burst eardrums <laughs> and like post-COVID and a chest infection, he still smiled. <laughs> Mm. So, yeah, God, I just want to thank you for Rafa. I want to thank you for the joy that he brings. I want to thank you that he is loved and created by you, Lord. And I thank you that he is going to be a healer, Lord. I thank you that he's going to live up to his name, Lord. I just declare that over him now, Lord. And I just thank you for all of the things that he's going to do in his life that are going to impact other people, Lord. Even now, he impacts other people, Lord. He's so precious and he's so strong in that, God. So I just pray that he will continue to be continually strong, continually precious and continually joyful. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Great. Thank you, guys. Just a final blessing. And actually, when I wrote this, it's, it's interesting. It echoes what you said. Sorry for nicking your, your psalm, is here. I didn't know about that. I, it's, uh, anyway, um, yeah, just um, felt called to say to Rafa, may you be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And that verse from Ephesians, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Bless you guys. Yeah, We're just going to take a song now. Um, and it says... Every soul you save sings out, everything you've made resounds. And it goes on to say, children in our Father's arms shouting out your praise. And that's our prayer for Rafa today, that he would come to know God as his saviour, that he would be shouting and singing his praise as he comes to know him. Let's stand together. <laughs> Wow. Uh -huh. 
We lift our hands, we turn our eyes to you again, and we surrender to the truth that all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration. Lord, we just want to say we adore you, we worship you, we love you. Speak to us now through your word, Lord God, by the power of your spirit. Lord, we pray you speak directly into our hearts this day. And, um, and Lord, just uh, challenge us where we need challenging, um, direct us where we need direction, Lord, and, um, and encourage us where our hearts need encouragement, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you want to take your seats. Um, so, uh, so this morning, we're going to continue looking at these kind of foundations. And, um, and last week, we looked at rule of life. I, I sent out a, um, a little link a bit late in the weekly update to direct you to some of the resources that I suggested last week. There's still a few, actually, of the printed workbooks from last week, if you want to grab one of those, if you find that helpful. Um, but today, we kind of explained last time that we were going to look at um, a few select kind of practices that we thought would be really helpful at this particular time, really, and in our culture and in this moment. And so we're not necessarily going to work through your kind of traditional spiritual disciplines. We've done a lot on that. Um, and, you know, there's those foundational um, rhythms that we spoke about of scripture and prayer that are so key and that undergird everything we do as a church family. But we wanted just to highlight some other ones that maybe um, we don't think about 
as much. And so this morning, we're going to look at hospitality. Okay, um, hospitality. And I want to start with a, a bit of a story. I don't know, actually, um, Jonathan, if you could put that little picture up on the, um, on the screen. I don't know which side it's going to come up on. It's going to come up on the stand I'm, side I'm standing on. Okay. Um, <laughs> can anybody... Can any, does anybody know, anyone want to guess where this picture's taken, actually, just interestingly? Any guesses? Whitstable. It's a good, it's a good guess. It's not, it's not in, this nation, in this country. It's a clue. Iraq, it's not Iraq, no? I said Israel, Kenya, France. Christine said, it's France. This is in Calais. Um, and so um, this is taken back in 2016 and uh, about sort of summertime. June, and at that time, I was going back and forth to the jungle in Calais, which was a, a refugee camp, and it was at its peak at that point. It had about 10,000 occupants, people from Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Syria, Iraq, um, Afghanistan, among many other nations, actually, too, but those were probably the majority. And many people who left difficult situations, they made dangerous journeys, they'd, they'd taken big risks and lots of people have been trafficked and uh, abused and beaten. Some have been enslaved along their journey in places like Libya and, and forced to, um, you know, forced to, to work as slaves for, for 12 months or more. Uh, and many who were gathered in Calais, um, you know, some of them were waiting to be processed in the, in the French kind of asylum process at that time. And others were hoping to make it into the UK, some to be reunited with family, but all of them hoping for a better life. And the jungle, the reason why I put this up here is the jungle is probably the most hospitable place I've ever been in all of my life. You could not walk through the camp without being invited into someone's shelter or tent for tea pretty much every 10 metres that you walked. And, and very often you would take up the offer. I would take up the offer very often. <laughs> and, um, and one day... I'd been visiting someone in a medical centre that was over on the far side of the camp. And, um, and we'd finished seeing this guy. And just as I was about to leave, it started pouring it with rain. And I mean, when I, when I say pouring it with rain, I mean really tipping it down. Um, so much so that we just stood and we thought, this will pass. I've always got this theory that the harder it rains, the quicker it's going to stop. You know, because the clouds can't contain that much water. This is very scientific, OK? Um, <laughs> But this particular day, my, my foolproof approach failed because it just went on and on and on. And in the end, I thought, I'm just going to have to go for it. So anyway, I, um, I set off running and, um, and there were other people who were darting around. And some people had grabbed like a bit of tarpaulin or, so, or bin line or something over their head. So I just looked for the nearest bit and there was lots around. So you can understand. So I grabbed this bit of tarp and I was running through the camp and it had quite a long way to go. And, um, and eventually sort of ended up in this, this, um, this little Syrian area of the camp. Wonderful people. And um, I'd, I'd been learning Arabic with one of the guys there. And I came in and I was just like a drowned rat, you know, totally drenched from head to toe. My clothes were soaking and they, they were sticky, you know, soaked to the skin. And um, this, this guy took one look at me, this young lad, and he, and he said, oh, come this way. And, um, and he took me and he got me a nice fresh, clean towel. He said, here, here, dry yourself. And then he went off and he came back with a fresh set of clean clothes. And he said, here, you must put these on. And, um, and, he, and I said, no, no, I can't take them. He said, no. And he insisted. So I put on these clothes and I was relieved. And then, and then, he, and then he came back and he put on a hot drink. And then they ended up cooking, cooking me dinner. And we sat round and, um, and I ate. And I sort of felt totally kind of restored, if you like, from my drowned state, put back together again by these guys. And these people who had very, very little themselves, very little resources, and they'd shared out of the little that they'd had with me and shown me um, just one of those moments of hospitality that I'll never forget, and it had a deep impact on me. Um, and yeah, not the sort of thing you forget in a hurry. And that, for me, is, is hospitality, OK? that's a it's a, it's a high bar, isn't it, really, um, of hospitality. But that, for me, is what real hospitality looks like. And it's about welcoming people into your life, actually, 
into all of your life, embracing them as family, whoever they are, putting what you have at their disposal. What, are, what is this person's needs? How can I fulfill them? And as followers of Jesus, we're called to extend the welcome of God. When Paul wrote to the church in Rome, in Romans 12, he wrote this to them. He wrote in verse 9, he said, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. You know, the, the, the simplest kind of two-word sentence there, practice hospitality. And it's part of what it means to be the people of God. This, this opportunity, actually, um, it, it gives an opportunity to demonstrate and work out much of those preceding verses in practice, if you like, to flesh out what sincere love looks like and devotion to one another and honour and, and joyfulness and generosity. Practice hospitality. And I want to say to you this morning, if you think... You know, hospitality, that's, that's not very spiritual. I want to say, no, this is a deeply spiritual practice as well. It's one of the most spiritual things you can do. Why? Because it's a means, actually, of us drawing closer to God. It's a means of us becoming like Jesus and touching the lives of those around us. And, and actually, I think it's one of the clearest expressions that we're given of the life of God. One of the clearest ways we can express it. So look at Scripture. I look at the life of Jesus. Um, you know, Jesus actually was falsely accused of being a glutton and a drunkard by his enemies, um, by the Pharisees, because he spent so much time at parties or round a table with other people. You know, and often he spent time with the sorts of people that others wouldn't have associated with. And then he tells parables about banquets when he teaches on the kingdom of God. And he places paramount importance on feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. We'll look at that a bit later. On the night before he was crucified, he shares a meal with his friends. It's the Passover meal, but it gains a new significance in him. And he tells them, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Why a meal? You know, why does he say to his disciples, share a meal in remembrance of me? Well, it's because, you know... It's because God loves to spend time with people. It's because, you know, his disciples would have always remembered Jesus around the table because that's where Jesus loved to spend time with them. You know, eating and drinking, enjoying one another's presence. That's what families do. You know, it's the family meal. And, and, you know, it's as simple and as profound as that. And in what terms are we told about the coming kingdom of God? You know, when Jesus returns, he makes all things new. Well, one of the pictures we're given is it's a, it's a great wedding feast. It's not just a picture. There's a reality here. It's a wedding feast. There's this great banquet um, that will come when we will celebrate our forever union with Jesus. You know, this is something that is to come, this marriage supper of the Lamb of Jesus. Hospitality is really important. And, and if you want people to know what the kingdom of God is like and to taste and see that the Lord is good, practice hospitality. Really good hospitality. Extravagant hospitality even. It says something about the generosity and the goodness of our God. Uh, you know, you might think when you come here, why do we serve such good coffee? And it really is good coffee. There's a plug there. Uh, you know, why, why do we like having pastries? It's not because we're sponsored by Bloss, although now I've said that, some people will think we are. It's, it's not because I'm a millennial, um, you, know, you know, and we just like drinking lots of coffee, or I just really like flat whites, although I do like flat whites. Um, you know, it's not just a gimmick because we want people to come back in person, although now you've heard this, you must be thinking, yes, actually, I've got to come and sample this. No, it's because we want to do hospitality really, really well. You know, this is just a small start. It's a small start, but you know, we want people to have, have fun, to enjoy being together, to feel at home when they come in here because this, we're family. And, and you know, that's why as a church, we want to prioritize hospitality this year and create space to hang out together and make up for lost time, really, I guess, and, and, and invite others in to join this community that we have here and have fun. Because actually, as we do, we're living out some of the values of the kingdom of God. Our lives look a lot more like Jesus 
when we live in this way. So just, I want to give you a few reasons why practicing hospitality is so key as followers of Jesus. If, if I haven't given you enough reasons already, if you're not convinced yet, here are a few more as to why it's important. Well, firstly, just following on from what we just said, it builds family. You know, there's that phrase, families that eat together, stay together. And, you know, it's healthy for a family to sit around a table. And it's a place where conversation happens, isn't it? You know, so if you pick up your kids from school, if you've got children, and you ask them, you know, how, how was your day? Um, you might get a fine, you know. And if you follow up with what did you do, you probably might get a, oh, I don't really remember. These questions aren't that helpful to kids, apparently, when at the end of a day. Um, but actually, round the table... Around the dinner table, that's when conversation opens up. You hear what's really going on beneath the surface as you just spend more time together. And, and actually, I think it's like a bit of a sacred space, isn't it? The meal table. And, and that's the same in the church. You know, if we invite people into our homes and cook people a meal, it builds trust and relationship. And, and you know, in that context, people let their guard down. It's wonderful sometimes to see what people, you know, are really like, um, in a good way, I mean, <laughs> you know, round the table. Because we often, we feel most free to really be ourselves, just to let loose a bit, you know. And I remember, just on this, I remember being on, on holiday in Turkey as a family, and, um, and we were at breakfast and you know when you go around like a buffet and you, you get all the bits you want. And so I got like, you know, a bread roll and, and maybe, maybe a croissant and some cheese and an egg and perhaps a bit of melon. And unfortunately, there's never kind of many of the um, parts of an English fried breakfast when, you, when you're in Turkey. But that's OK, because they make up for it in lots of other ways. But I remember doing this um, once in this hotel. I was coming back with my plate. I felt really pleased with myself because I think I'd got a bit of pretty much everything in, in the whole place because that's obviously the aim. And, and I was looking forward to tucking in and I noticed a, a, a Turkish guy and he came and he had this plate just stacked full of melon. I looked over and I thought, that guy must really like melon. Um, and then I noticed that, that his wife came to the table. She was carrying a plate with lots of different bread. And, and then, you know, one of his sons came with a plate of cheese and then another came carrying some meats. And then they sat down, they put all their contributions in the middle and, and then they shared this feast together. And I remember looking a bit enviously at this point and I just thought, you know, I prefer their way of doing it. There's, there's a, it was almost like a bit of a visual parable, I think, actually, for me at that time. You know, in the UK, I don't think we get hospitality in the same way as a lot of other cultures do. We have a lot to learn. And, um, and you know, I, I thought about this and I thought if someone pitched up at, at kind of, you know, my table, then without anything, they, it would have been a bit of a tough time. We'd have had to scrape a bit off here and a bit off there. And, um, you know, we might manage to cobble something together. But if someone pitched up at the table of this family, there was, there was room, you know, they were sharing everything together. It would have been easy for, you know, one, two, three people to come and just join in and there'd always be space just because of the way they did things. But hospitality builds family. And it's this kind of attractive family, if you like, that people want to be part of. You know, it's a family that offers hope and joy and love that is welcoming. This is what the family of God's meant to be like. Practice hospitality. You know, intentionally seek regular opportunities to invite others into your home if you're, if you're able to do that, if you're privileged to be in that kind of position. Um, and if that is difficult for you, actually, intentionally find opportunities to go into the home of other people. And, and hopefully... You know, after this morning, there'll be lots of invites flying around. So don't worry if you don't regularly get invites, because, because this morning, hopefully, you will. And, and, you know, if you are someone who's part of a family and you're, you know, you you, yeah, you're privileged to have your own home, then, then look out for those people who are, who are on their own, you know, who, who need encouragement, who, you know, who just want, a, you know, a bit of, a, you just need a lifting up and spend time with them, you know. And I think the reason why it, that Paul says is practice hospitality. There is an element of this, you know, especially actually in our culture. If you're a really busy person, you need to actually make space to say intentionally, this is a space. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice hospitality. I'm going to make the time. And it's always worth it. 
You know, it's, as I say, it's a spiritual practice that God loves. So hospitality builds family. Secondly, hospitality breaks boundaries. You know, for many of the reasons we've just shared, hospitality is a great way of breaking down barriers between people, barriers you didn't even know existed, or building bridges, if, if you prefer that image. You know, Jesus spoke about loving your enemies. I remember um, hearing a story about a woman in Pakistan, a follower of Jesus, and um, when she read in the scripture about loving your enemies, she decided she was going to bake a cake and take it around to her Taliban neighbor. You know, that's, that's hospitality. Uh, or back in the jungle camp, again in Calais, when the, sort of the, the CRS, they were like the French kind of riot police, um, who, who was sort of meant to keep order um, it, among refugees, they were going to demolish some of the camp. And so some of the refugees, they, they laid out tables with lots of food and drinks and things that they prepared, they put a big sign saying, please help yourself. And do you know what? These poor police, they didn't know what to do with themselves <laughs> when they saw this. It was totally disarming. You know, they, they, didn't, they didn't know how to carry on with what they'd been set out to do. Canon um, Andrew White, you know, the vicar of Baghdad, I remember hearing him speak once and he talked about when he dealt with different factions and, or maybe kind of religious groups. I mean, he did a lot between Sunni and Shia people in, in Iraq. Um, or, or even when he was dealing with some quite extreme people, he would always seek to get people around a table to eat and talk. Uh, he'd invite people for dinner. He even reached out to IS and invited them for dinner too. They declined. I won't say what they said to him. But, um, but actually, he had many fruitful conversations around the dinner table where where people just gained understanding, they listened to one another, and relationships were formed. Jesus, um, always good to look to Jesus' example. When he went to Samaria, uh, he met the woman at the well. What, what was the first thing he did? Oh, well, no. Yeah, he asked her for water. He asked her for a drink. Exactly. You know, he asked for hospitality. And, and that instantly was a way, actually, of breaking down the barriers between a Jewish man and a Samaritan woman, or at least raising the question, why are you asking me for a drink? But, but you know, like Jesus was saying, he, he was willing to receive hospitality from this woman. And that was a powerful thing. And, and Jesus told the parable, didn't he, of the good Samaritan who bound up the wounds of the man who, who fell among thieves on the way from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho, and who brought him to an inn, and who took care of him and paid for all of his expenses, you know, radical hospitality, um, you know, between, between people who were meant to be enemies. What are the barriers in your life? You know, who, who would you think about this? Who would you normally invite into your home? Just think about the people who you normally would come into your house. Are they people who look and think and act like you? You know, I, and if that's the case, you're not in a, you know, you're in, you're in quite a large group of people. But, uh, you know, I want to say in a Christian context, that is kind of your kind of lowest common denominator hospitality, right? That's, that's the baseline, but there's so much more. You know, radical hospitality actually means inviting in people who maybe you find more difficult, maybe where there's sacrifice involved, um, uh, perhaps Blessing people who may have wronged you in the past and seeking reconciliation around the table. Building bridges where relationships might seem like they're under strain rather than just leaving it as it is. Or perhaps addressing hidden prejudices that you don't even realise you have. You know, sometimes people don't ever invite someone from a different cultural background into their home. You know, and... And if that's the case, it, it might not be a conscious decision, but we need to seek to address that. We really need to seek to address that as the church. Um, yeah. Hospitality provides sanctuary. I know this is especially on people's hearts right now. Um, I actually think that this aspect of hospitality is a really unfamiliar concept in UK society, although it's going to become much more familiar, hopefully. Um, but right back in the Old Testament, God said to the people of Israel in Leviticus, um, he said, The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You know, God, he reminds his people, you know, that they themselves 
with the outsiders and look at the way you were treated in Egypt. You're not going to treat people like that, are you, says God, because you're a different people. You've been called out and redeemed by me. And, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't the last time God's people were going to be exiles either. Actually, in the New Testament, uh, Peter reminds us that we are foreigners and exiles in this world. Our citizenship, it belongs in the kingdom of God, which is not yet fully here. And, and I think remembering this helps us, you know, just as it helped the people of God in the Old Testament to be compassionate and generous to those in need of sanctuary, to be open-handed with what we have and with our homes. Hebrews 13, um, verse 2, is kind of well-known verses where hospitality is concerned. But it says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have, been shown, have shown hospitality to, to angels without knowing it. You know, which is like one of those whoa kind of verses. Um, but to the first Jewish readers, actually, they'd, they'd have heard this. They'd have instantly thought about Abraham and Lot and, and Gideon, these people who, who welcomed in angels. And I don't think it means, actually, we're to live life anticipating God's going to test our hospitality. I know sometimes people think this. God is going to test me at some stage. He's going to send an angel my way. And if I miss that opportunity, then I'm going I'm to be in real trouble. So I've got to live on my, I've got to keep on my toes. Um, you know, the, the danger there, if you do think like that, is that, um, is that we'll show hospitality in case it's an angel rather than showing hospitality because it's a person in need which is even more important, actually, in the eyes of God. Do you get, do you get what I'm saying there? Um, but think of the example of the disciples, even, on the Emmaus Road. You know, they, they entertained Jesus. They invited him back to their homes without knowing it until he broke the bread right in front of them. And, and Jesus himself, he speaks to uh, those who are righteous, those who are sh- invited to share in his kingdom. And he says in Matthew 25, 34, Come, You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You know, if you thought hospitality was a side issue, you need to read this scripture. You know, it's right at the heart of things. You know, in fact, Jesus is saying hospitality, it's like an identifying fruit, a hallmark of true faith in Jesus. And and it's seen in the way that we care for others. It's not a legalistic stick to beat people with. Um, You know, I'm not saying you must welcome any stranger who comes along into your home because there'll be many occasions where that's wholly inappropriate or unwise. But we do have to change our mindset where hospitality and attending to the needs of others is concerned. And we do need to make sure it's more shaped by Scripture than it is by our surrounding culture, because Scripture looks very different to the way uh, that our wider culture operates in this area. And of course, one really live example right now, isn't it, is people offering to open their homes up to Ukrainian refugees. And that's a massive change of heart to the narrative around refugees in recent years, which is, is good to see, and hopefully that will extend and continue. Uh, and of course, we need to be praying, I think, as a church, that refugees are placed in suitable and appropriate homes, you know, with hosts that are motivated by compassion and not extra income, you know, or that, and that traffickers and other dangerous people don't take advantage of this system. That's important. But also, we need to seek wisdom as, as followers of Jesus, on whether we should be offering our homes at this time, actually. You know, because we want to ensure they're safe places, places of sanctuary for Ukrainians who are coming here. So where better to stay, actually, than in the homes of some of the people in this room, I'm sure. And we want to be ready as a community, as a church community in any case, whether we can do that or not, to welcome people from Ukraine into our town, and, and not only Ukraine, but anybody seeking refuge. Wouldn't it be wonderful 
if, if Ashford was known as a place where if you came to it from any nation, you got a warm welcome. I know that won't have always been the case in the past. And I'm really sorry if there's people in this room where you've experienced kind of, uh, you know, um, you've been the outsider. You haven't had the welcome that you'd want others to have extended to you. That grieves my heart. But I hope that we can be a town and a church where we extend that kind of warm welcome of God to all. Uh, you know, we're called to be the most hospitable people in the world because we follow Jesus. And finally, um, but, but very importantly in this, hospitality enables evangelism. If you think about it, actually, hospitality itself is, is good news. It's not the good news, but it's good news, isn't it? And, and we've spoken about how, how hospitality builds community and provides sanctuary and breaks down barriers and how people open up. And actually, people open up to God through hospitality. There's a reason why Alpha courses start with a meal. You know, it's like a winning biblical formula, if you like. <laughs> the Holy Spirit moves through the giving and receiving of hospitality. If you want people to know Jesus, share a meal with them, because that's what Jesus would have done. And see where the conversation goes, and listen to them, and share, and talk, and share your heart. You know, in, in this regard also, I want to say receiving hospitality is just as important, if not more so. You know, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. He didn't invite him around his place. You know, he asked the Samaritan woman for a drink before suggesting he, that she should ask him for the water of life. He sent out the 72 with nothing and told them to find people of peace, people who would open up their homes to them, who would extend hospitality towards them and to stay with them till they left that place. Because these are people who are going to be open to the message that you're going to bring. They're going to help you to share the good news. Um, they may even be people who can open up the rest of the community to the gospel. You know, the interesting thing here is that, uh, you know, these disciples sent out, they, they came powerless in the world's eyes. They came with nothing, you know, well, nothing, if you like, apart from that spiritual authority which they'd been given, which was more than enough. But if they'd gone with wealth and riches, then people would have been drawn to them, but not necessarily for the right reasons, not necessarily for the message that they brought. But here, it's like the power dynamics are the other way around. And they, they are to depend on the hospitality of strangers. And as they do, that's when opportunities for the gospel unfold. It's really important. You know, receiving hospitality is just as important as giving it. And, and in any case, hospitality creates this environment where we can share honestly and openly and vulnerably and deeply and welcome people into all of our life and be authentic. And, and that should inevitably mean you know, sharing our faith, you know, speaking about the most important thing, the most important person in our lives, who is Jesus. So we're committed to growing in the practice of hospitality as a church because it's the welcome of God. And it means inviting people into all of our lives. It's more than a cup of tea and a, and a biscuit. It's about building family and creating space around the table for others, breaking down barriers, bringing peace and reconciliation, providing sanctuary and provision for those in need and enabling the gospel to be shared. And as we come to the Lord's table now, we remember we worship a hospitable God who invited us into all of his life through Jesus, to share in Jesus' life, who builds family and calls us to the table as brothers and sisters, who breaks down the barriers you know, that, that, that were between us and God, everything that ever separated us from God, who died for us while we were still sinners, so that we could have no condemnation if we put our faith in Jesus. You know, who... who did everything to reconcile us to himself and who gives sanctuary to those in need. We come as those who are hungry and thirsty. We come to this table with nothing to bring to the table, actually, except ourselves. You know, nothing would merit us come to here and we receive from the Lord. And as we do so, we see the gospel shared, don't we, visibly in the bread and the wine, reminding us of the body and, and blood of Jesus given for us, the blood poured out for us. And when we eat this bread and drink this cup, the Apostle Paul says we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I just want to say this morning, there's room at this table. 
There really is room at this table, believe me. There's room for you, there's room for me, there's room for everybody actually in this whole community. You know, everybody, anyone who will humble themselves and say, Lord, I need you, I want to receive from you today. Anyone who will receive the Lord's hospitality and make room for God in their life too. So let's just take a moment to pause um, before, we, before we share at the table together. And Lord, as we come to your table, we can't help but think of the many people in this community who don't know you. We can't help but think of many people in this community who struggle to put food on their own tables. And Lord, we can't help but think of many people who, who don't have homes and places of sanctuary at this time. People free, fleeing from Ukraine, but not only from Ukraine, from Eritrea and Sudan and um, Syria and Afghanistan and um, Lord, places around our world where it's, it's unsafe for them to stay. And Lord, I thank you that you invite them to your table. Thank you that there is space for them at your table. Thank you, Lord, actually, you lift the lowly and you bring them up to the place of honour at your table. And, um, and Lord, we, we thank you that we can find a space here. Thank you for what you've done for us, Jesus. And Lord, may we extend your generosity and goodness and heart and gospel to all of those around us, Lord, those who um, come to mind now, and Lord, also those who you'll bring across our path, Lord God, in the coming weeks, months, and years. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So what we're going to do this morning as we continue in worship, maybe the band can come up, and um, we're going to have a table at the front here and a couple of tables at the back. And we're still at this stage at the moment where actually we talk about physically gathering around the table. Uh, with COVID and everything, we have to be a little bit more careful. But, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to invite people to come up and share. And you know, I appreciate there'll be some people here who might still be a bit reticent and wary. Um, and, and, you know, you might just not want to receive this morning because, you know, because of COVID and touch and things, that's fine. But there will be hand sanitizer around on the tables. Um, we, we want you to use that before you take the bread and wine. Um, don't worry, this won't be forever that we have to say these things, I'm sure. Um, but, um, but yeah, we want everybody to feel like they can come and share this morning. And that's why we do these things. So, um, so we're going to come. We're going to take bread and wine. And we encourage you just to, to eat. And, um, and maybe also, if there's somebody in particular this morning you want to serve the bread and wine to, I um, just want to encourage you to do that and look for people who might find it hard to get up to um, the table. Um, take the opportunity to pray and minister and bless one another at the same time. But as I say, it's a little bit different this morning. It's not at good hospitality-wise. It's a bit self-service. But actually, you know, the Lord, the Lord is with us. And if you're online this morning and you've got bread and wine at home, um, we just um, pray God's blessing as you share with us. But let's remember that Jesus gave his body for us, you know, the, the bread of life that satisfies all who come and share. And he shed his blood for us. And this cup is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Jesus. This is a sign of our relationship with him. So this is for all those, all those who want to come and receive from the Lord this morning, all those who want to sit at his table and, and you want to share in his kingdom, just come. You can come and you can share. You're welcome. Let's, uh, let's worship. Thank you. 
Slight update or an omission on my part uh, regarding the quiz. Of course, I did forget to tell you what time it's going to start, and that's seven o'clock. Um, and if you can raise a team, we would be most grateful. It's a lovely opportunity for church to bless those who are in desperate need of a blessing. If you'd like to see Ben Oliver, who's at the back somewhere, I think, Linda, who's also at the back somewhere, or contact the church office. But let us make next week a great blessing to all those who are working hard for the people of the Ukraine. Um, and also thinking of those people who are setting the questions, they would rather set them for many rather than few. Okay, just want to sort of round it off, just to remember that we have church meeting straight afterwards so those online stay on we're going to have a quick break refreshments to continue in hospitality let's there have lovely coffee let's have a croissant yes. or whatever goodies are at the back and let's mingle let's talk to each yes. other and let's celebrate today um so thank you for joining us um and we pray that as you go out after the meeting that you continue practicing this hospitality you know, let's bless each other. Let's um, be intentional about, you know, loving and sharing lives with others. And are we not going to be blessing people this evening? Absolutely. We are. So, yeah, and continuing on. So, we later are. on this evening, on. Sunday Night Live. Yes. So, come along and continue. Yes, come along and be yeah, blessed. And have a great yes. time. Yes. There we go. Let us close <laughs> in prayer. We thank God for the time that we have been able to share around His table. And, Father God, we ask that for each of us you will equip us, Lord, with the grace given by yourself through the power of the Holy Spirit, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that will work within us and through us, Lord, to bring hospitality, friendship and love to those we meet in the days to come. Amen. <laughs>